Well, welcome to everyone to the 2022 Center for Global Higher Education annual conference this year, completely online as it was last year. Maybe next year we'll have a double format with a face-to-face -face conference and an online conference. But the online conference is great because it enables us to connect to everyone across the world. I'll just set up my screen share. There we are. Tell me if you can see that, colleagues. My screen now visible. Yes. Great. Now, the conference is mounted by the Centre for Global Higher Education. As I've said, the centre is funded by the Economic and Social Research Council in the UK and supported also by Research England. And it runs 10 active research projects at present. It generates a range of outputs. We think we have significant impacts on policy and practice. And you'll hear about those dimensions tomorrow when our projects report in the afternoon. We also run a global webinar program uh, and we'll be resuming face-to-face -face seminars in the UK soon. Here's the list of the current projects. Um, various uh, projects looking at global, national and local aspects of higher education. Now, some are more UK focused than others, but most have a comparative dimension. Um, for example, a governance project uh, has, is about to publish a book which covers not just the UK, but Norway, Germany, Hungary and Ireland. Um, the, the project looking at the public good role of higher education has done casework in Japan, China, South Korea, France, Finland, Poland, Chile, Canada, and the UK. As I said, all these projects will be discussed tomorrow. Well, why a Centre for Global Higher Education? Well, international and global dimension uh, has become more important. <clears throat> and clearly it impacts uh, national and local higher education in lots of ways. Now, despite the present geopolitical storms, uh, global activity in higher education and especially in science is still growing. The output of global research and internationally collaborative papers continues to rise year by year. And as the pandemic settles into its endemic phase and so that after a fashion we live with it, I think the um, mobility of students will, international mobility of students will return to its growth path of the pre-2020 period. But all is not straightforward and simple in the growth of global higher education. I mean, global higher education is highly unequal and the bibliometric collections in global research contain few papers other than those in English. We'll discuss that at this conference. Global rankings have been constructed in such a way as to favor universities from the Anglophone countries and reproduce their, their dominance at world level, despite the fact that uh, capacity in higher education and science is much more broadly distributed across the world than it was. The present global regime in higher education looks unsustainable in the longer term. And there are other issues and problems that we must deal with. The economic market model has never really been right for higher education. <clears throat> it does not value the contribution of higher education to the personal development of graduates or to the collective public good. I mean, it focuses on employability, although the labor market outcomes of graduates cannot be controlled from higher education alone. Jobs and careers are closely affected by the social backgrounds of graduates and their continuing social networks. The transition to work is a shared responsibility in which large and small employers and the professions and occupations are very important along with higher education. And we have a parallel set of issues, misplaced expectations, again, in relation to social mobility and social equity. Inequalities are deep seated and cannot be overcome by changes in higher education alone. Social reform is a shared social responsibility. Effective partnerships with schools are key and changes to income distribution, wage setting and the tax spend agendas of governments are arguably more powerful than education in changing society, although higher education is part of the solution and we have responsibilities 
to open up the sector to all social groups as well as we can. But perhaps the most notable development in higher education in the time in which CG has been actively researching has been in geopolitics. I mean, populism and geopolitics are increasingly impacting the sector across the world. We have had, we have some autonomy as a sector, fortunately, yet we are also connected with the nation and with the world at many points. And all the big changes seem to impinge on higher education now. And in some of these changes, higher education institutions and science are protagonists or themselves under fire. Brexit in the UK has stopped the entry of many European students, ended much research cooperation and truncated the slow formation of a regional European identity in UK, a process in which the universities were playing a leading role. The US determination to retain global supremacy vis-a-vis -vis China has triggered a new era of securitization in science and technology, which is significantly reducing collaboration between China and the West. US-China co-publication in 2020 was overwhelmingly the most important nation-to-nation -nation collaboration in world science. That's already looking like an, a past era that's receding. That productive and happy arrangement is unfortunately eroding. Securitization plays out in visa restrictions and suspicion towards academic faculty with joint appointments in China and the US. In the other quasi-Cold War, Russia, after two decades of struggling to kickstart internationalized universities with world-ranked science, has junked this policy completely. It's turned to aggressive militarism and the shutdown of freedoms and international links in its own universities have taken it out of cross-border relations in higher education, perhaps for decades. At the same time, much of Ukraine's higher education has been stopped in its tracks. Ukraine's population is two thirds that of the UK. It's a relatively large European country. It has a large higher education system and one that needs international support. Nativist politics, intrinsically in tension with international connections and readily mobilized against universities and science and triggering uh, increasing tendencies to racism in the mainstream of politics are exercising major influence now in the US, the UK, India, Russia, Brazil, and parts of Europe. There are more shifts and shocks to come, I think. We can expect a tremendous existential struggle over climate science as campaigns to stop fossil fuel companies gather momentum. Those companies have deep pockets and will roll out their formidable capacity to shape media, social media and government, targeting individual scientists, attacking them to discredit their work and attacking the universities that house them. CG will continue to monitor these changes, to research them, and of course, to discuss them in our webinar program and in events such as this conference. These discussions involve everyone who's tuning in today. Throughout this conference, there'll be ample time in each session to ask questions, make statements, and in this way, share our thinking. There'll also be pauses, breaks between sessions, as the program shows. But let me emphasize the need for your participation. Wisdom and understanding are built by dialogue and asking questions. I hope you use every opportunity in the next two days to take part and that you enjoy the conference greatly. It's now my pleasure to hand over to Paul Ashwin, who will chair the first keynote session. Thanks, Simon. And I'm delighted to introduce um, the first keynote of the conference. Um, my name is Paul Ashwin, and I'm a deputy director for the Centre of Global Higher Education. Um, as I said, I'm delighted to be introducing Professor Tricia Greenhalgh, who is Professor of Primary Care Health Sciences and Director of Interdisciplinary Research in Health Science Research Group at the University of Oxford, and has been a really important voice of critical reason in debates about public health and COVID-19 in recent times. So it's 
brilliant for us to have Trish as a keynote for our conference. Um, just before Trish starts, just to say, if you have questions or comments you'd like to raise at the end, then please put them in the chat. And um, from the chat, um, I will use that to ask people to ask questions. So if there's things you want to, to raise for discussion at the end, then please put them in the chat. Um, and then without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Trish. Trish. Well, thank you very much, Paul. And thank you for inviting me to give this opening keynote for the CGHE conference in 2022. And as you can see, um, the title of my talk is Science in the Public Eye, Communicating and Debating Research Findings in Real Time in a Global Public Health Crisis. And actually, we've got a whole hour for this, but I'm not going to speak for an hour. There's going to be plenty of time for uh, you to uh, comment and, and join in, because this is such a live issue, as, uh, as we all know. Um, before I start, as well as thanking you for inviting me, I just want to acknowledge my research team, my collaborators, the University of Oxford, and these funders who are currently funding my work and um, their logos are here for you to look at. I won't read them all out, but really uh, what I've got to say today is as a result of conversations with many colleagues and also generous funding uh, from many uh, organizations. But let's go back now almost two years to June 2020, where there was already a conference being held online, of course, called COVID-19 and the post-truth age. And Roy Shulman, in his summing up of that conference, said this, the COVID-19 pandemic is the most blatant expression of the dangers of the post-truth age, characterized by less confidence in institutions, a lack of agreement on facts, and a blurring of the line between opinion and fact. And if we go to the dictionary, post-truth appeared in the dictionary in, in 2015 or 2016, I can't remember. It was actually in public use from the late 1990s. And it's defined as this, relating to or denoting circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal beliefs. And of course, those of us who are um, academics, those of us who value higher education uh, are really troubled by this whole post-truth phenomenon. Uh, and I want to really try and unpack uh, our relationship as academics to this. And of course, the media are absolutely key uh, in this. All right, let's have a, a, a slightly trivial example to get us warmed up. Here's November 2020, it's someone on Twitter who's quoting then President Trump, who's making the claim, I came up with vaccines. Um, and I very quickly subtweeted that and said, yeah, and I'm on the front cover of Vogue. Um, and within a couple of hours, this picture was circulating uh, in on social media, courtesy of Craig Yamey, who's a graphic designer. There I was on the front cover of Vogue. Uh, and the reason why I'm, I'm giving you this example is that this is the speed with which claims get made, but also how people put together imagery uh, and, and, and visuals uh, and get them circulating to uh, bolster any uh, kind of claim. Uh, okay, let's now have another example. Here's a pamphlet, which you may have seen circulating, it particularly happened on Facebook, but it was also on Twitter and various other social media outlets and also reproduced in some of the mainstream tabloid media. Uh, and you can see how this is constructed. It's, it's, uh, it begins, your health, your life, your choice, be safe. Uh, it's entitled Face Mask Safety, know the facts before you wear one. And they make six claims that masks decrease your oxygen intake. That doesn't sound too good, does it? They increase your inhalation of toxins because they don't allow you to clear your, your exhaled uh, poisons properly. Shuts down your immune system because all those toxins get into you and do bad things to your immune system. Um, 
and uh, it, it increases your virus risk, it doesn't just, just have a neutral effect because there's all these viruses inside your body that are dormant, but because of these poisons, they wake up and they do bad things to you. Um, masks, say this pamphlet, uh, are scientifically inaccurate because they've got holes in, of course. If you look through a microscope at a mask, there's holes in it, and the virus is small enough to get it through those holes. And finally, the sixth claim that the science of masks is really very flaky. They haven't been properly tested uh, in peer-reviewed studies. Okay, so I took hold of this leaflet, had a go with my, um, with my laptop, and I made this one. You can see I've set it out in exactly the same way. With the, with the face mask safety title and know the facts. And I presenting six different facts that it has no intake, uh, no effect on your oxygen intake, no increase in your inhalation of toxins. It doesn't damage your immune system. It doesn't, uh, it de decreases virus transmission, not increasing it. Um, and they are scientifically accurate because the virus, of course, doesn't travel naked. It sits on tiny little particles. And if you measure the, the size of the particle rather than the size of the virus, uh, the holes in the mask are the right size. And there are, uh, there's strong evidence of effectiveness. Now, unlike the people who made the original pamphlet, I uh, checked my sources. I'd looked very hard uh, for studies to support the claims, but I'd also done what scientists are supposed to do, which is look for what we call disconfirming evidence. Was there anything that challenged uh, the claims I was making? And if there had been, I would have changed my interpretation. Uh, so I put this out and worked hard to get that circulating so that when you went onto Facebook, uh, you at least had two of these and you had to kind of get your head around uh, which one you wanted to take account of. Now that was a little warm up exercise. And it tends to uh, lead us to this uh, rather, rather naive conclusion that there's these honest scientists working away in universities who generate something approximating objective truth. And that objective truth is then distorted by bad people in the media, either social media or mainstream media. And that's what leads to public confusion. But actually, it's not like that. And I'm now going to spend a few minutes explaining why it's not like that. Look, one of my interests is the social science of science and the philosophy of science. And these various books are just examples of a very uh, rich literature uh, in which uh, people have studied the scientific process, um, both empirically and theoretically. And this literature suggests that scientific truth is a lot more complex than many people assume. And I'm gonna just briefly explain uh, some of those in, in a second, but let me first start by um, telling you a little bit about our master's course. I set up a master of science course at the University of Oxford a couple of years ago. It's called Masters in Translational Health Sciences, but that needn't concern us. And this is the very first group assignment that we give our students. So we send them out of the lecture theater in groups and we tell them to go and get a fact. Uh, to carefully note the context in which that fact was generated. You can bring a qualitative fact, a quantitative fact, any fact you like, but you've got to bring it back to class and then defend it to your classmates. And I can tell you that no fact that has been carefully plucked from its context and brought back into the lecture theatre, the seminar room by a group of students has ever survived the scrutiny of their classmates. Uh, of course not. That's what learning at master's level is all about. You, you learn to uh, challenge the facts. Um, and this wasn't my idea. This was Steve Woolgar's idea, who's a professor of sociology, now retired. Uh, and he started the go and get a fact exercise. Um, and he was also a co-author on this book that I've already shown you. The lead author was Bruno Latour, who you may have heard of in relation to something called active network theory. And what they did uh, for this book, which is subtitled The Construction of Scientific Fact, very interesting metaphor there. Um, they looked at scientists in laboratories uh, and they kind of depicted them as a bit of a strange tribe uh, with their own myths and rituals. And I love this quote from that book. Some statements made by scientists appeared to their fellow scientists more fact-like than others. And this was exactly what we found when we did the go and get a fact exercise is that some uh, claims made by groups of students 
have great appeal to their fellow students. And that's a fact. But something else that a, a, another group of students have, have put together, maybe from a different discipline, uh, don't, they don't recognize that as a fact. They're all very interesting. And another really fascinating <clears throat> and, and very relevant, pandemic relevant uh, uh, observation of this book was that visuals were really important. Diagrams, graphs, tracings, all those kind of things. It could look at it and get a, a visual um, <clears throat> picture of what science is about, uh, come to depict the way things are. And this is something that Latour called inscriptions or inscription devices. Um, you can think back to the early months of the pandemic and there were various uh, charts and diagrams, particularly of, of, of kind of uh, cases of COVID going up and then an arrow coming down with some kind of intervention and then some aspect of what they called flattening the curve would happen. And so we all got our heads around the pandemic by looking at those pictures. So they were pretty important. Now, the Tour and Mulgar were drawing uh, certainly indirectly on the work of Kuhn, this fabulous book uh, published, I think, in the late 60s initially, uh, where Kuhn introduced the concept of the paradigm, which for the purposes of this lecture, I'm going to define as a set of concepts which are linked in theories about how they fit together. And the paradigm also has a set of agreed and approved methods and particular instruments that the scientists use to uh, collect their facts. Uh, and within a particular paradigm, you've got to basically fall in with what other scientists are doing, and that's called normal science. Or you can take your football and go to a different field where you say, well, actually, I, I don't um, hold with that particular set of concepts and theories. I want to use different methods. Uh, so that's known as a paradigm shift or indeed when it happens on a big scale, a scientific revolution. Now, paradigms are not necessarily bad things. It, we, we simply can't get rid of them. Uh, they do constrain our thinking, but they also provide a sort of conceptual scaffolding which allow us to refine our thinking and build the, the, the depth and detail that you need in any scientific uh, research tradition. So that's Kuhn. Um, Becher and Trauner uh, did something rather similar to the Tour and Wulgar, actually, but they studied not just scientists, but uh, humanities people too. And they, they also hang out in tribes and defend their territories. Let's have one slide on Foucault, uh, who, of course, I'm sure many of you know, uh, wrote about the close links between knowledge and power. And in this quote, I'll, I'll read it out. He said, in any given culture, at any given moment, there is always only one epistem, which I've translated as scientific worldview, that defines the conditions of possibility of all knowledge, whether expressed in a theory or silently invested in a practice. Uh, I think one of the interesting things about Foucault's work is, is the way he, he says, it's not just what people say, it's not just the papers we write, it's also the practices, the things that we do that are um, part of that scientific worldview, part of that epistem. Um, finally, Bourdieu, uh, who was, was writing in, in, in many levels, in, in, a, in a similar vein, he talked about knowledge as academic capital, things that we amass, the, uh, for example, the fact that I hold a tenured professorship at the University of Oxford, that's a bit of scientific capital, my H index is a bit of scientific capital, all that kind of thing, uh, the fact that policymakers phone me up and ask my advice is scientific capital. Uh, and what Bourdieu said is that there is, a, it's sort of similar to what Foucault is saying, really, that there is an orthodox version of science uh, and th those in the orthodoxy uh, amass more scientific capital. Those in having a heterodox view, those outside that, that scientific mainstream are going to have a much more difficult time uh, getting their ideas uh, aired and taken seriously. And that's precisely what I'm going to talk about now. So just to sum up the, 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 the refined picture of the science media relationship, what we actually have is, is scientific tribes, more than one actually, with, with, with each of those tribes has a shared mental model of the way things are. Of course, it progresses over time and gets refined and changed. Um, but as Foucault said, at any given moment, there is that particular scientific worldview, but that is also associated with vested interests uh, in existing power and prestige structures. 
And scientists in a particular tribe generate a particular truth which makes sense within that paradigm. Some media run with this truth, but other media follow other tribes. And the result is public confusion. Now you can see what I've done here, I hope, that, that the scientists are now part of the problem as well as potentially part of the solution. And the media, importantly, is as much part of the solution to this as it is part of the problem. And that's the kind of frame shift that I now want to talk you through with some specific examples. So here we are in March, uh, just early April 2020, and there is a now infamous tweet put out by the World Health Organization. It's still there if you want to look for it. Fact, they say COVID-19 is not airborne. This was very premature, because uh, actually it is airborne. Uh, what they said was the coronavirus is mainly transmitted through droplets generated when an infected person coughs, sneezes or speaks. And to protect yourself, you've got to protect yourself against those droplets. OK, so wash your hands. Keep washing your hands. Do you remember all that hand washing we were doing? Disinfecting sur surfaces and avoid touching your face because then, otherwise you might pick up a droplet of saliva or some other horrible body fluid and then transmit it to someone else. Uh, so that was what the WHO were putting out. Uh, meanwhile, the same week, some colleagues and I published this paper in the British Medical Journal, arguing for something called the precautionary principle. We weren't arguing that, that COVID was airborne because we didn't know that then. What we were arguing was we didn't know how it was spread. We were saying that um, maybe it could be airborne. Maybe, just maybe it might be a good idea for people to wear face masks because something was making this uh, virus spread. And while we were waiting for proof, uh, we should act before we had uh, hard and fast, 100% sure evidence, uh, partly on the basis of the many stories that we had. Now, this is an interesting thing. Um, are you the kind of scientist who takes notice of a story or are you not? But the story that got me going, writing this paper, which we wrote in, in about mid-March, uh, was a, a story about a concert that had happened in one of the big concert halls in Amsterdam on the 8th of March, 2020. I think it was St. Matthew Passion performance. Uh, and following that performance, there was not many cases of COVID in the Netherlands before that concert, but 130 people, uh, many members of the choir uh, were developed COVID, uh, many were hospitalized. The conductor, I think, uh, ended up on intensive care and four people died. So this was kind of pretty dramatic. Hey, goodness me, it's hit, hit Europe big time. Maybe we should wear masks bef before we have uh, hard and fast proof. Well, uh, the airborne nature of uh, SARS-CoV-2 is linked to the question of whether we should be wearing masks and uh, coming back to what I would call the fake news pamphlet, the post-truth pamphlet, uh, by September 2020, we had Scott Atlas, who at the time was President Trump's COVID advisor, quoting three authoritative sources uh, to support the claim that masks don't work and it would be a good idea if we didn't wear them. The first was the WHO. The second was the Centre for Evidence-Based Medicine here at Oxford, Professor Hennigan. Uh, who by complete coincidence really is in my department and the Center for Disease Control and Prevention in the US. Now, I do not believe that any of those three sources would have looked at that pamphlet on the left and said, yes, we endorse these claims. Of course they didn't. Of course they can see that this is poor science. What they did do was make confident statements uh, that they were uh, not convinced that there was enough evidence in favor of masks uh, and they were putting out cautionary statements like, please don't touch your face. And the mask might act as what we call a fomite because it might have those droplets uh, with infected saliva on it. So don't go near it, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and the point I'm making here is that once you have placed a scientific claim into the public domain, you cannot control who uses it or for what purpose. Well, let's now go a year later and scientists are still arguing about whether SARS-CoV-2 is airborne uh, and uh, also uh, on the value of masks. Now, what we've got here is two papers that came out within the space of three weeks. One is by the Center for Evidence-Based Medicine team on, on the left, 
And they're saying, no, there is not enough evidence that this virus is airborne. And what that means is that they are also arguing for scientific caution, policy restraint. Let's not put in uh, measures to control the airborne spread because we haven't demonstrated that it exists. And that was published on the 24th of March, 2021. Uh, three weeks later, some colleagues and I published this paper in The Lancet. Uh, we believe that there was lots of different evidence, uh, strong and consistent evidence in support of airborne transmission of SARS-CoV-2. I should say that the paper on the left was published only as a preprint, uh, and I'm gonna say more about that uh, in, in a minute. So here we have uh, rather embarrassingly and slightly by coincidence that we had two scientists, myself and Carl Hungen, in the same department arguing for opposite um, uh, scientific uh, arguments, really. We were presenting these, and, and some people in the media immediately said, oh, Oxford scientists would disagree with one another. But I think that really was coincidental because what, what Hennigan and, and team were doing was reflecting a much wider worldview that uh, was the uh, agreed worldview of the evidence-based medicine community. And I was reflecting the view with, uh, of, a, of a wider community too. So you could depict uh, what we were doing as the work of two academic tribes. The first tribe, the Hennigan tribe, was the evidence-based medicine tribe. And the totem that it worships, if you like, is the hierarchy of evidence. Uh, the second tribe is pragmatic public health, and that, that was my tribe. Uh, and its totem, we have totems too, is the real world case study. So that's the kind of thing we, we really get into is a, is a good juicy uh, real world case study. Uh, now, the interesting thing is that right at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, I was working very closely with the Center for Evidence-Based Medicine. Uh, and after a bit, I thought we've got some paradigm issues here. I, I, I'm not kind of comfortable with the theories and methods. And so I took my football uh, and joined a, a different tribe. Um, so let's just present the, um, the, the evidence-based medicine paradigm. There is a hierarchy of evidence with randomized controlled trials at the top. And you, if you talk to anyone competent in EBM, they will say, look, this is not uh, something that is completely hard and fast. Of course, some types of evidence, some, some research questions don't need RCTs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a little bit of a caricature, but there is no doubt that broadly speaking, the RCT is greatly valued uh, and, and that is linked to a, an underpinning assumption that good science is assumed to be defined by the use of correct methods. It's a methodological hierarchy um, that even if you're asking a question for which the RCT isn't the best method, uh, you will have some other method that is deemed to be the best method for that particular question. Uh, but in most, though not all cases, EBM will say that if participants are randomized in an experiment, that's good science. If they're not, it's less good science. Uh, and this actually is a pretty good um, way of looking at the world for certain research questions and in certain contexts. I speak as a survivor of a poor prognosis cancer. I am only alive because of a randomized controlled trial, uh, which uh, stipulated what treatment I should be given. And that was many years ago and I've been cured for a long time. So, so this isn't, this isn't uh, a bad thing, but this is a particular paradigm. And at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, two of the EBM people, Hennigan and Jefferson, uh, applied this hierarchy of evidence to mask research. And what they did was they rejected this in the Cochrane Review, they rejected all evidence except RCTs. Uh, so they effectively chopped off the red triangle at the top of the hierarchy. And you can see they've put all other studies in the metaphorical trash can. And their conclusion was evidence from 14 trials on the use of masks versus no masks was disappointing. It showed no effect in either healthcare workers or in community settings. And that was where the fact, fact in inverted commas, that masks don't work came from. Uh, and it ended up uh, being appropriated by Scott Atlas in this tweet and cited directly by President Trump. Now, they weren't, uh, that their intentions were very honorable. They really believed that those randomized trials were the route to scientific truth. And within their paradigm, perhaps that was the truth. 
But now let's move to pragmatic public health, because this is a very different tribe. It has very different scientific and philosophical assumptions. And the first of those is that there is no universally applicable hierarchy of evidence, although, of course, some methods may be more or less fit for purpose. And also, uh, any method can be applied well or badly. This tribe believes that good science is defined by the use of multiple methods, adaptively and pragmatically, and also ethically and democratically, to build a nuanced narrative of what has happened and why. For this tribe, theory is at least as important as method. As Ken Judge says, we need strong theory and flexible methods. And this tribe uh, believes, and I think it's maybe one of the most important things, that all the evidence needs to be explained. We cannot simply uh, say this evidence is low quality, therefore we can ignore it. We, we have to have a look uh, and, and explain precisely where that evidence fits or why it doesn't need to fit. Now, the kind of studies that you get hold of, if you put your hand into that metaphorical trash can and say, well, hang on a minute, what did they not look at? Um, you get some interesting studies, actually. So here's sneeze videos. Now, if you're an RCT person, a video of somebody sneezing is, is low quality evidence. But actually, you can see this is published in the New England Journal of Medicine. When somebody who's unmasked sneezes, you get these amazing turbulent clouds of gas that travel many meters, certainly uh, further than one meter or two meters or whatever the socially distanced thing is. Um, and they travel right across the room. Um, and then choir stories. Here's a, here's a peer reviewed paper published in the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. It's an extraordinary story of a choir of 60 uh, people, 52 of whom caught COVID, two of whom died. And what they did here uh, was they interviewed every single person, or every single person who didn't die. When did you arrive? Where did you go? Which room did you go into? Did you use a lavatory? Did you eat any of the food? Did you help clear up the chairs, et cetera, et cetera? And they did a bit of number crunching and came to the conclusion that you cannot explain this particular outbreak by uh, people sharing the same plate of sandwiches, the fomite uh, hypothesis, or the handle on the toilet door or whatever it might be. So a real world case study, if you like. Other uh, things you find, if you put your hand in the metaphorical trash can, uh, include this fabulous paper by Christian Leffler, uh, published towards the end of 2020, which looked at natural experiments. And you can see that the countries uh, depicted by the blue and the orange lines in this graph, the countries who introduced widespread public masking before 30 days of the first case in that country, had orders of magnitude fewer deaths than countries which didn't introduce masks for the first 100 days. Now, uh, and you can see th 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 these are obviously old figures now, but there, there are thousands, tens of thousands of times more deaths in the unmasked countries. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that masks uh, cause the difference, but what it does mean pretty much is that they don't kill you, uh, and it also is one piece of evidence that demands an explanation. And let's look at one more type of evidence that was put in the trash can uh, by applying the by EBM's hierarchy of evidence. This very elegant uh, piece of work published in Nature uh, of ferrets. So you had at the beginning, you had a sick ferret in the bottom cage and a healthy ferret in the top cage. And the only connection between those two cages was these air ducts, and you can see it goes around a lot of right-angled corners. That's because droplets don't go around corners. Uh, and sadly for the ferret, the healthy uh, top ferret develops COVID quite predictably uh, when connected to the air or, that's being breathed out by the bottom ferret. Now the purists would say, oh, but that's an animal study. And we all know evidence-based medicine says you can't uh, extrapolate from animal studies to humans, but they're not thinking here. We're not saying the drug works in a ferret, therefore we can use it in humans. We're not doing that. We're using the ferret experiment to demonstrate something about the air. And uh, you know, if, if the, the virus is airborne for ferrets, it's gonna be airborne for humans, or at least, 
If it isn't, somebody needs to explain why. You can't simply chop it off and say, well, it's low quality evidence. So here's the weighing scale again. The EBM traditionalists would really like a randomized controlled trial, but even they, I think, confess that this isn't going to happen. So they say, all right, we're only going to accept the following kinds of evidence, the methods-based uh, approach, consistent, direct isolation of viable virus from air samples. I mean, if, you, if you talk to people who sample viruses from air for a living, they'll say it's really, really hard to do. So the fact that some studies uh, actually end up negative uh, isn't too surprising. Um, and the other uh, thing the EBM people want is consistent, direct infection of humans from sharing air. So, so if, if it doesn't happen all the time, then it doesn't happen at all. Now, uh, as far as they're concerned, that mean, that the absence of that kind of evidence means that the overall conclusion is that either COVID is not airborne or that there isn't sufficient evidence yet. Uh, the public health people who got together with aerosol scientists say, no, there's tons of evidence. And you guys got to explain all this. You've got to explain the super spreading events, particularly the ones involving singing. You've got to explain long range transmission in quarantine hotels where people pass on the same genetic strain of COVID, even though they never uh, enter a corridor at the same time. They never touch any common surface. You've got CCTV evidence of that. Um, asymptomatic transmission, that half of cases of COVID are transmitted by people who are not coughing or sneezing, that indoor spread is much, much more risky than outdoor, the ferret experiments, air sampling studies, which very often do identify viable vi virus if you do them properly, um, the presence of SARS-CoV-2 in air filters, and the fact that hospitals who introduce widespread mask mandates for both staff and uh, patients dramatically reduce hospital acquired COVID. So as far as we were concerned, you stack all this up, looks pretty much as if this virus is airborne and it's time to act now, uh, not waiting for some kind of gold standard evidence. But the EBM line uh, was unconvinced. The lack of recoverable viral culture samples of SARS-CoV-2 prevents firm conclusions to be drawn about airborne transmission. The current evidence is of low quality, they said, having applied the hierarchy of evidence, and there's an urgent need to standardize methods, meaning everyone's got to use the methods that are accepted in this particular tribe's paradigm uh, and improve reporting. Could you write up your studies the way we would like them written up? Now, I would say that if you know your Bourdieu, this is a classic orthodoxy power move. Uh, this systematic review was funded by the World Health Organization, uh, and it was seen to be the gold standard of evidence. So, of course, those with the orthodox scientific capital are able to start making statements about the current evidence being low quality. And as Hugh Davis says, evidence is what powerful people say it is. But this living systematic review questioning airborne transmission, failed peer review twice, and the authors appear to have decided not to update it. So we're now more than a year later. Uh, it looks like the orthodoxy has been partially overcome. Now, how did that happen? Well, uh, I was partly to, to blame for this, uh, and I was to blame for it uh, because I felt this was a massively important scientific question. I lost my own mother to uh, hospital acquired COVID uh, when at a time when people weren't wearing adequate masks in hospitals. Uh, and I personally felt that there was uh, a massive risk that the pandemic would continue to kill people unnecessarily. So this wasn't a personal vendetta. This was uh, a scientific issue about which I felt extremely strongly. Uh, and I worked with uh, five colleagues from around the world uh, many of whom were aerosol scientists. And this is what we did. We moved very quickly to summarize what was at the time a heterodox view in a very short paper for The Lancet, 1200 words that your academics, that's you, to get uh, the evidence summarized in not much more than a thousand words is, is a tough challenge. We persuaded The Lancet to publish it. That took a lot of backstage negotiation going back and forth. Um, the eve of publication, we mobilized our networks, uh, our social media networks, our press offices. We put out a press release 
Um, and within a week of publication, this paper was the most tweeted about Lancet paper ever. You can see its outmetric score is well over 20,000. It's still in the top 25, I think. I haven't checked this morning, but it certainly was a few weeks ago. And we did radio. Uh, we did the breakfast TV sofas and we were in, actually, I think, nearly 200 newspaper articles. So we we absolutely played the media uh, as hard as we possibly could. Uh, I now want to talk a little bit about mental models, because, uh, as I said, I don't think the EBM people were being bad people. I think they were just working within a particular mental model. Um, and I wrote about them here in this in this paper um, called miasmas, which is airborne diseases, if you like, mental models and preventive public health. Um, and in this paper, I wrote about two different infectious diseases. One was COVID-19 and the other was cholera back in the 19th century. I'm going to tell you a little bit about that in a sec. But I, I started that paper by quoting Immanuel Kant, his critique of pure reason in 1781, in which he said thoughts without content are empty, intuitions without concepts are blind. Uh, that's a little bit of a kind of brainful. Um, you may prefer Sean Carroll's version, theory without data is blind, data without theory is lame. In other words, you need both. If you're going to be going collecting data, analyzing data, um, you, you will have a particular mental model, whether you, whether you know about it or not. So here's the cholera example. You'll be very familiar with this, and I'm going to go through it quite quickly. John Snow, the Soho cholera epidemic in the mid 1800s, and of course the Broad Street pump, which lost its handle. So the prevailing theory of how cholera was spread, uh, which was put about by people uh, like Edwin Chadwick, who wasn't a bad person by the way, but he, you know, had, he was particularly keen on this theory, which turned out not to be true. The miasma theory of cholera, that cholera spread through foul air, in other words, the smell of sewage. And in the mid 1800s, they had these statistical returns. You know, public health was quite a big thing there. Um, and they used to collect certain data every week. They used to find out what the weather was like, particularly temperature, humidity, what the air smelt like. People used to go around and writing down smells bad, smells not so bad. Elevation of the land, because miasma was believed to stay very low to the ground, whether the houses looked or smelt clean, and also whether the containers used for water uh, looked clean, but they didn't measure uh, where that water came from. And John Snow and his partner, Henry Whitehead, uh, the first thing that they, they did, and the thing that really, uh, really allowed them to make this scientific breakthrough was they changed what data was collected. Which pump did people get their water from? It was added to the weekly statistical returns in 1853. And uh, very quickly, they got their data and they managed to identify the pump as the source of the problem and remove the handle uh, in 1854. And the outbreak of cholera in Soho very quickly uh, came to an end. That's not the interesting bit. This is the interesting bit. A year later, the National Board of Health, who were the orthodoxy people, the people who were very keen on the miasma theory uh, of cholera, uh, felt that um, Dr. Snow really didn't have enough evidence for his waterborne theory. And here's the language they're using. And you may recognize the tone. After careful inquiry, we see no reason to adopt this belief. We do not find it established that cholera is waterborne, nor is there before us any sufficient evidence. So uh, if you go back to um, Latour and Woolgar saying some things, some facts uh, appeared more fact-like than others, uh, you can also see this uh, as what I would call an orthodoxy power move. We are just not uh, going to accept this. Uh, and here is the editor of The Lancet writing in 1855, which is a year after Snow had removed the handle and, and, and actually uh, stopped the uh, little epidemic. In riding his hobby horse very hard, Dr. Snow has fallen down through a gully hole, has never since been able to get out again. Which is a bit of a rude thing to say about someone who's actually come up with a, a pretty good theory about a, a, a disease. Snow died in 1858. The miasma theory of cholera persisted, continued to influence policy, 
until an even bigger cholera outbreak in London in 1866, where eventually they traced almost all the victims to a particular source of water. Uh, and even then, uh, there was no big article in the Lancet, there was no big statement, hey, we got it wrong. Slowly and quietly, the miasma theory of cholera was replaced by a waterborne theory. And that's what's actually happened uh, it, with COVID, although the other way around, that the waterborne theory of, of COVID has quietly been replaced by an airborne theory, uh, but there's been no big statement about uh, getting it wrong. Okay, I'm going to give you one more brief example because it came up yesterday, yesterday, 23rd of May 2022, the UK Health Security Agency published its protocol for investigating this new outbreak of fulminant hepatitis in children. And that protocol did not include the suggestion that we should check whether or not those children either currently have or have had uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection. The point I'm making here is that if your mental model of COVID-19 is that it is mild in children, and if your wider policy narrative uh, is all about getting people back, uh, getting society back up and running, getting kids back in the school, getting people back in the office, et cetera, you won't look for, and you won't want anyone else to look for evidence of SARS-CoV-2 infection in a mystery illness that's causing liver failure and death in children. So that's yesterday. Let's come back to why the WHO took two years to say that COVID is airborne. This is a media article. It's written by a journalist. Uh, it's written by a journalist who interviewed me as well as a, a lot of aerosol scientists. Uh, and it's published in Nature Comms. Um, she begins by drawing people's attention to that tweet that I started this lecture with, fake news, COVID is not airborne. And then she takes us through uh, a very important uh, offer made in July 2020, where 237 aerosol scientists from around the world wrote an open letter to the WHO offering what they called overwhelming evidence that this virus was airborne. Uh, the offer to help was rejected. And Dr. John Conley, who uh, was a co-author on that Hennigan Systematic Review, but also he chaired the key WHO committee, which not only commissioned the review and paid for it, but also rejected airborne theory for two years. And uh, there's some suggestion that they, that committee are still uh, not convinced that the virus is airborne, although other parts of the WHO have now announced uh, that this is an airborne disease. We wrote about that committee here, uh, and we uh, undertook a Bourdieusian analysis of uh, the orthodoxy and what we call playing the scientific game, uh, the practices that you have to in engage in, um, to explain why infection control science at the heart of the WHO was so slow to uh, take up the scientific evidence. And in that article, we argued that mental models are not neutral. They're linked, as Bourdieu uh, told us, to scientific capital, to power, prestige, accolades, influence. Uh, and those who hold these mental models have got a vested interest in defending them very fiercely. So here's my summary slide. Um, the first take home point is that scientists operate within shared mental models, which are developed by previous scientists in our field, that normal science that Kuhn talked about, that these orthodox ways of doing science, as um, Bourdieu and others have, have demonstrated, bring us status and power, what they called capital, which we have a vested interest in defending. The media will pick the science that aligns with their narrative and offers a good story. And my final point, which we might wanna discuss, if you don't ride the tiger of mainstream and social media, it will ride you. So thank you for your attention. I'm now going to stop sharing my screen and we can have a discussion. Thanks, Trish, for that um, wonderfully um, rich keynote um, you've given us. Absolutely loads to think about. <clears throat> I really like the way in which you gave 
such a rich sense of the way in which people can disagree in good faith and that can have disastrous consequences. So thank you for that. That's absolutely brilliant. Um, so we've got a number of questions and comments um, in the chat um, that I'd like to invite people to ask. Um, so the first one comes from Amru Waishid Alu Waili. Would you like to ask your question? Yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes, yep. we can. Okay, excellent. Thank you for the interesting and fruitful, insightful talk. Thank you, thank you so much. And this is somehow related to what I'm doing. Uh, <clears throat> so my question is, is it because of COVID-19 or is it because of the age we are living? So if you take uh, um, uh, masks and social distance, so I'll take your statement that there are some statements are more fact-like than others. So if you compare masks with social distance, you see that there is uh, somehow confusion with masks unlike social distancing. Is it because there is no scientific uh, agreement? Is it because uncertainty? Or is it because uh, the nature of the fact that this is somehow more fact-like than others, okay? And there is another element when you compared countries with masks. Uh, there is something I think, I think most people don't see it, which is the experience factor. If you take other countries like South Korea, uh, which was good uh, with COVID, because if you go back and see MERS, which was in the Middle East, but the highest number of death were in South Korea. So they learned the lesson, they learned the experience. Yeah, so this element was not, uh, I have seen the literature, but most of the people, they don't include this element in their explanation. Thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And, and the, the, um, the whole question of um, why we didn't learn from Asia, why Asia's practices, Asia's social practices, not the whole of Asia, uh, but uh, in, for example, Taiwan is a good example. The, uh, as soon as the first case of COVID was described in Taiwan, everybody went out and bought masks immediately. And in fact, the government had to ration them because <laughs> there, were, you know, there, there was already um, within the kind of public understanding that there were certain diseases that you could protect yourself against by wearing a mask. That had not happened uh, in most of the West. But actually, I don't want to get too sidetracked into the evidence around masks. My, my, the point that I was making, and I, you're right, I did slightly oversimplify things, is that uh, there was a very dominant scientific approach in which it was acceptable to reject all evidence except randomized controlled trial evidence. And that got the scientific community into hot water. That's I think great. the other, actually the other thing you, you mentioned was uh, uncertainty and different scientific um, communities take different approaches to certainty. And, and that's, you know, it's for philosophical reasons, actually, the whole, the whole notion of whether or not it is possible to achieve scientific certainty, whether or not evidence can ever be definitive. Uh, and I'm actually doing quite a lot of work with some pragmatist philosophers who say, look, you're never going to reach the truth. You might get closer to it, but, but the truth for pragmatists is something that is what they call indefeasible. I love that word, I can't spell it, indefeasible. In other words, that the truth is something that you can't knock down with um, a particular piece of scientific evidence. And when you look at the ferret experiment, you think, well, wait a minute, if it can't explain the ferret experiment, it isn't the truth. Um, we may not know exactly what the truth is, but we know that, that it's, got to in, it's got to explain the ferret. That's great. Thanks, Trish. And that, and that reminds me of debates around causation and social science and yeah. whether we can ever get there or not. Um, next, uh, Diana Laurelard. Um, Diana. Thank you. Hello, Trish. Well, I thought that was an absolutely brilliant tour de force. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was had this strong conceptual framework and it it had brilliant science and emotional impact as well. So thank you. But I have a very pragmatic question about methodology, really. 
because um, evidence-based approaches are totemic for educational research now, RCTs in particular, within, um, you just have to look at the work of the Education um, Endowment Foundation for that. And that's very difficult for us because it's so difficult to control all the many variables in any kind of teaching context. We borrow it from science because of the success of that paradigm. Now, my question is, could we be working to a pragmatic public education? Could we borrow that from you, from mm. medicine? Um, and would it have the same power, do you think, to convince education leaders? Well, I think I think we are in a, um, we're in a terrible space, aren't we? Where the randomized control trial, and as I say, I'm a fan of RCTs. I'm only alive mm. because of RCTs. I am not opposed mm. to them, but where we have um, a high degree of complexity, where we have multiple interacting variables, where we cannot control uh, what's going on, then paying lip service to the, the RCT methodology actually distorts uh, the truth. And of course, Diana, you and I were introduced many years ago by Lewis Elton, and I'm going to bring him in because he'd be turning in his grave right now. Mm -hmm. I remember Lewis saying to me years ago um, when he came to help us do some evaluation of a, of a course I was setting up, you know, nearly 25 years ago. Um, I remember Lewis saying, you can randomize five-year-olds. If you've got a class of five-year-olds and you want to look at a different method for teaching reading, uh, you can randomize, perhaps, you know, cluster randomize different classes or something like that. But as you move up the kind of educational ladder, it's very hard to randomize PhD students, for example. And this, the, the fact that randomized controlled trials are now seen as the gold standard form of evidence in parts of inquiry where they shouldn't be seen as the gold standard of evidence is highly problematic. Um, and I am still hoping to get a European Research Council grant to uh, look from a philosophical perspective at wh why and how complex grand challenges cannot be addressed uh, purely or even primarily through RCTs. Um, because I think that science and, and academic inquiry is going seriously off the rails uh, as a result of blind faith in the RCT. And although, you know, on the shelves of philosophy, philosophy of science, uh, libraries. There are very good reasons why that shouldn't happen. Yeah, the work of Nancy Cartwright, for example, mm -hmm. uh, and, and many others. Uh, actually, the people who are making the decisions don't read those books. And what we need is um, a way of influencing, which involves, I think, those policymakers, if you like, um, co-designing and co-developing and getting skin in the game of the studies, uh, which would be uh, a lot more pragmatist, actually. Fantastic news. I hope you get that project. Thank you. That's great. Um, and our next question comes from Melissa Schusler. Melissa? Um. Hi there, good morning. Um, Trish, thank you so much for your talk. I really enjoyed that. I'm just wondering your closing comment about writing the uh, tiger of social media. And Twitter, of course, a very big tiger. But what I'm finding when I see my students um, is that it's TikTok that they're really looking at, engaged with. And I'm just wondering your thoughts on TikTok and how the media is disseminated through that. It's very quick, it's very snappy, it's um, it's, it's different to, to, to Twitter. So I just wondered your thoughts on TikTok or if you even have much experience with it. Just 10 times worse, isn't it? I thought I'd done so well getting on Twitter. And then my kids say to me, nobody's on Twitter apart from aging academics. Yeah, no, you're right. You're absolutely right. Um, I do need to start making TikTok videos. I've done a TED talk or an, not an actual TED talk, but a, a TED style talk when the Academy of Medical Sciences um, wanted to try and shake off its cobwebby reputation. 
and they are they offered training in making in doing TED talks. And so I volunteered for the training. And then I realized that part of the deal was I then had to do this TED talk in front of all their donors. And so I sort of stood up, you know, just in my clothes and no props for 10 minutes. Um, and that was scary enough. That was terrifying. But TikTok is an, is, an, is worse, isn't it? But yeah, we do have to do it. We do have to do it. Great. Um, the next question comes from Rachel Brooks. Rachel. Thank you. Um, thanks for a great talk, uh, Tricia. Uh, my question, I suppose, was about the concept of post-truth, because you started off your talk talking about it, but I suppose didn't come back to it at the end. And I was just wondering whether the kind of, you know, the, the, the experiences that you told us about were more about um, signed, uh, sort of the, the media and um, public not being aware of competing explanations in science than yeah. actually about adherence to, to post-truth, because I think you could argue, you know, that the, there is a kind of a thirst for objective facts within the public and, and not always a kind of you know recourse to, to emotion but that actually it's a kind of a lack of understanding of how science operates that's the problem perhaps rather than post-truth and the appeal to reason all the time. Uh, I think it's a bit of both. I am absolutely amazed at how particular narratives that have absolutely no basis in in um, properly demonstrated scientific facts continue to circulate, not just within the lay media, but also within the scientific community and the policy community. Um, it, it, it is completely gobsmacking. And so I think, yes, you're right, I didn't come back to post-truth and I should have done. Um, but, but that's wh where we're living. And, and we have to spend more and more and more of our time uh, I wouldn't say manipulating, but working hard and carefully with those segments of the media that can, um, that, 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 that are capable of doing the bit that we scientists are not very good at, which is packaging what we're doing uh, for uh, the lay public. Actually, a guy from um, America came over. He was studying Jon Snow, actually. He went to Soho and looked at the handle on the pump and he read my paper on the miasma theory and he interviewed me and and for a, an american radio program and i thought do i really want to do this you know it's beyond the, why, why would it matter to me but of course that radio program goes out to millions of people at prime time uh and yes we do because unless the public gets their head around this um, and and, and the, the cholera story is such a good story as counterpoint to the COVID story. People might then realise that it's not just scientists disagreeing, it's scientists hooked into um, an outdated mental model. But of course, that's not post-truth. That's, that's mental models. There, there is another phase of that, which is um, where the populists are taking hold of that, as Trump did with the mask thing and, and, and manipulating it. That's great. Um, Trish, are you all right if we run a few minutes over just because I've got a few more questions? Is, is that OK it's with you? OK by me. OK, so we'll just run five minutes over. Um, so the next question comes from Victoria. Victoria. Hello. Uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, first of all, congratulations for Tricia. It is a very interesting uh, presentation. I have a comment. Uh, in my opinion, the relationship between uh, pre-paradigms paradigms and meta-paradigms is very sophisticated. Uh, mm. And uh, the reflections about mental models uh, it is uh, another uh, issue very important for teaching STEM. Uh, could you uh, add some comments uh, about this uh, problem, please? Oh, goodness. So you mean, should we require all scientists to study the philosophy of science? I think they do that in France, actually. Um, I would love that. I, but... A few years ago, when I was at UCL, I spent a long time at UCL, um, we got a big grant from the Leverhulme uh, Foundation to look at evidence as it played out in different disciplines. So we have people from ancient history and, and psychology and music and statistics and medicine and policy and all that kind of thing. And, and philosophy, of course. And um, 
when we were when we got that grant, what we were trying to do was get people to, to think about the, the philosophical assumptions and we couldn't find any basic scientist who was interested in looking at the nature of reality. So, so we were interviewing, you know, we had Mary Douglas on that, on that grant. She came along and talked about the assumptions and critical theory. And you can imagine it was all great fun. Um, but when we got the basic scientists to come in uh, and say, when we'd say, well, look, you know, we, we think this is the way you see the world, they just weren't interested. They just weren't interested because for them, the world is, and we, there is only one worldview. Um, and we spent a long time having arguments, actually, and it was very productive arguments. We all wrote a book, book about it in the end. But it kind of made me realise that, oh, maybe that was maybe that was because they didn't do philosophy when they were undergraduates. And they, maybe they should have done philosophy of science. Uh, but I find it rather striking that, that those in certain paradigms, for example, don't believe that there are any paradigms. And that, and that I, I can't quite get my head around that. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I don't know if you've got a better a better suggestion because yeah, I bet you I bet you do, and we should give you a bit of space to tell us. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Um, and uh, now, now I have a question from David Mills. Trish, that was great, and I love the idea of a scientist who's in a paradigm but doesn't recognise they are in part of one. Um, so, uh, so just a question, really thinking about that hierarchy of evidence that you present us with the diagram. Um, it's a ranking of forms, isn't it? It's a, it's a ranking where certain forms of knowledge are more credible than others. Mm. Without suggesting there's a paradigm shift, do you think that triangle is its slight danger of being questioned more? I mean, do you sense that perhaps it's not so secure? I mean, is that what, what, what the implications of this discussion within WHO is, that we're going to begin well, to question our Well, it's... It's, it's two years since I published a paper called Will COVID-19 Be Evidence-Based Medicine's Nemesis? Um, so you can look that one up on Google Scholar if you want. Um, I am trying to persuade, there's a journal called BMJ Evidence-Based Medicine, and I'm trying to persuade them to run a series of articles on um, what, for, for, for slightly political purposes, I'm calling mechanistic evidence. Um, be and, and actually, there's some people within the EBM movement that have in introduced this concept of EBM plus, which is kind of saying that we still want our paradigm because, hey, guess what? We've got a lot of scientific capital built up, but we'd now like to bring in mechanistic evidence, which means every all the other forms of evidence. Uh, so we're going to call it EBM plus. Um, so that's the language that they're using. Um, and at the moment, I'm, uh, you know, I'm. I've had reviewers comments back on a paper which presents this and saying that, you know, if it's called adapt or die, that's what we've called the, um, called the paper, meaning EBM has got to adapt or die. But if you go back to your coon, uh, what we're really saying is we'd like you to rebrand yourselves so that you don't have to admit that your, your, your paradigm is now out of date. Uh, so it'd be like Einstein going along to Newton and say, look, we'd like to give you gravity plus. Um, <laughs> so you can you can still have keep your chair at Cambridge and all that kind of thing. Um, but it's now going to be gravity plus, but it's going to be theory of relativity and all that kind of thing. And, and I, I'm not sure it's going to. Uh, but it, but it's actually a really interesting question because I started getting involved in the evidence based movement, evidence based meta movement in the early 90s. Um, and Gordon Guyatt was publishing, he published his first paper in 1992, saying this is a new paradigm. You know, we're no longer going to be doing medicine by priestly authority. We're going to be doing it, you know, medicine's going to move into this scientific space, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that was one of the most successful paradigm shifts ever, ever. And EBM has, has encroached, as Diana said, it's taken over education, it's getting everywhere, it's evidence-based policy, evidence-based management, goodness knows. Um, and it's, it's moved from Kuhn uh, to Foucault and Bourdieu, it's, it's, it's become actually quite sinister. So I think that hierarchy of evidence isn't going anywhere very fast. But at least let's be reflexive about it. At least let's be clear that that's what's going on and that there are orthodoxy power plays 
all over the place and let's call them what they are. That's step one. Okay, that, that's great. I'm afraid we need to leave it there. Apologies to people who um, I didn't have time, we didn't have time to call on. Um, I'd like to finish by thanking Trish for an absolutely stunning keynote. It's an absolutely brilliant start to our co conference and, you know, the reflexive and engaged way you responded to the questions and comments was also brilliant. So thank you so much. Um, it's, it's been the perfect keynote to start a conference right. on higher education knowledge in the plural world. And thank you ever so much. So thank you, Trish. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we now have a um, short break, shorter than it would have been um, before the next session, but, but thanks everyone for your contribution and particularly thanks to Trish. <laughs>